Welcome to the 14th Market Insight and our first digital event. Thank you for supporting the webinar and hope there's something useful for you to take away over the next hour. Unfortunately, we can only offer a digital bacon roll. And with my supportive kids asking what the vegetarian option is and whether the rolls are gluten free, I can assure you when we come back in 2022 for number 15, we'll have a wider menu choice. Our speakers today are Peter Dolman with some 30 years experience in the East Midlands market who will talk on the industrial and distribution sector and Craig Straw, our Head of Business Space to review and look forward on the region's office market. I will be sandwiched in between and talk on the retail and investment market which I'm sure will be informative. Before we start, all the data for today's presentation will be sent out to you as per normal and will save you scribbling madly. We will host a Q&A at the end of the session with the assistance of Cartwright Communications. I appreciate there may be some wider questions and I've asked Gary Woodward, our Head of Management, Mike Thorne, our Head of Building Services and Steve Holland, our Head of professional services and valuation to join us for the Q&A alongside Peter, Craig and myself. If you have any questions, simply type them into the box below at any time during the presentations and we'll be answering them at the end. But now, without further ado, it's time for me to sign off and hand over to Peter. Good morning, everyone. Well, this is very different. When I began to look at preparing this overview of the industrial market within the region as a whole, it soon became apparent that we must be doing something right. And as many people have said, if I had known on the 23rd of March last year how the year would have turned out, particularly in terms of these numbers, I would have happily taken that, rather than the apparent abyss that confronted us. What is becoming increasingly obvious is the need to differentiate between our more traditional marketplace and the strategic distribution sector, for the overall take-up figures are skewed by these large one-off transactions that could provide a rather false sense of security. Importantly and beneficially, they are an increasing phenomenon and a significant driver of employment and development activity in our region. This sector was no different last year as our shopping habits had to change, accelerating the gradual move from the high street to an online existence. So to give you an idea of the magnitude of this market, uh, here are some of the key deals that took place in 2020. At Hinkley Park, 532,000 square feet to Amazon, at Magna Park, 377,000 square feet to Armstrong Logistics, 359,000 square feet to Countryside Properties, and 225,000 square feet to Oakland at Barden. And moving further north, Games Workshop took 177,000 square feet on the East Midlands Gateway, whilst DHL took 900,000 square feet. And in Derby, a lodger, took Panatone's speculative unit of 371,000 square feet. As a sector, general online activity was some 51% higher than in 2019, which as a result produced a record year of take-up of some 50 million square feet. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, Amazon took 25% of this, but for the first time, there were 25 buildings over 500,000 square feet built and occupied during the year. Locally, the East Midlands accounted for 25% of this take-up, some 12 million square feet. And of this, 44% were design and build solutions, whilst 25% represented the take-up of speculatively built units, perhaps vindication for those developers who decided to build. Within the East Midlands, this level of take-up has led to a fall in supply of 8%, down to some 5.7 million square feet. And as a result of this, confidence is obviously high, as demonstrated by the 
one million square feet of speculatively built accommodation at Magna Park by GLP Gaisley. If we put the strategic distribution market to one side and concentrate on the dynamics of the Leicester, Nottingham and Derby markets individually and the take up of units below 50,000 square feet being the more normal level of local activity, Leicester and Nottingham seem to be on a par with Derby slightly behind at the moment uh, having been affected by the fortunes of Rolls-Royce which in many ways drives their industrial sector and can be seen as a barometer of their marketplace. Compared to 2019, Leicester and Nottingham are again broadly similar. Derby overall having done better this year off the back of the large letting to a lodger. Breaking this local take up down still further, all three cities show the same characteristic that there are significantly more disposals under 10,000 square feet than in any other size bracket. In Leicester, these accounted for 50% of disposals. In Nottingham, this was 69%, and in Derby, 86%. Over the year, we saw an increasing number of inquiries for smaller industrial units, probably stemming from a growing number of new starts, but also modest expansion from a number of existing firms. Inquiries still come from a plethora of sectors, but there is no greater demand being shown by distribution companies than there is from manufacturers, which is encouraging. Of course, take-up is to a point determined by availability, as there is no quick fix when faced with a shortage of supply. Availability in terms of square feet would seem to be satisfactory, thus allowing take-up to continue to the extent that it has in previous years and will need to continue. Leicestershire's availability looks very substantial, but put into context, 2.5 million square feet is represented in 14 buildings all over 50,000 square feet. There is, of course, 1 million square feet available at Magna Park. To compare, there are no buildings over 50,000 square feet in Derby presently, and in Nottingham only two, with the possibility of one new speculative unit of 70,000 square feet at Castlewood. So, how does local availability under 50,000 square feet compare to the levels of historic demand? On this basis, there would appear to be a modest imbalance between supply and demand, which is addressed to a degree during the year with the general churn of second-hand buildings becoming available. The issue to a point in recent years has been that the quality of this product coming onto the market has not been satisfactory, thus making the case for new speculative and bespoke development as is provided for within the strategic logistics sector. With good demand and constrained supply, so rents and prices have risen accordingly to allow this to happen. Rather than run through them now, our estimation of rents and prices is fully outlined in the fact sheet that will accompany this session. Land supply is such that new development to cater for smaller but no less important occupiers is now on the way across the region with new product expected this year in Wigston by Chancery Gate, Brought Nastley by Gelsons, Stony Stanton by Clowes, Fleckney by Venture Properties and in Lutterworth and Barden by Tungsten Properties. In Derby, the Sir Modwin scheme off Pride Park will provide much needed supply close to the city centre as will progress at Infinity Park and the 85,000 square foot consented scheme re-evolution by Howarth Developments at Sinfin. In Nottingham, the recommencement of marketing at Trent Gateway will now put 95,000 square feet immediately back onto the market following the change of scheme ownership last year. So, before I hand over to Matthew to talk us through the road and retail and investment markets, 
I would reiterate the almost countrywide sentiment that the industrial sector has proved fantastically resilient despite some monumental challenges. The development sector seems fully in tune with this and has responded accordingly to provide hopefully a balanced marketplace. I hope that this continues to be the case. Certainly it has started well this year. Thank you Peter for your overview. I'm not sure you need my 30 years experience in the retail and roadside sector to understand that the market was very challenging last year. You're also unlikely to hear any commentators refer to us as a nation of shopkeepers for some time. There is no doubt that a number of the casualties and changing consumer habits were coming and this process has been accelerated, actually turbocharged or more up to date, dual motor electric powered. As you can see on the screen, a graph of historical internet sales as a proportion of total sales shows a move from 20% in February last year, peaking at 36 and 31% in November and December, the two busiest shopping months of the year. Speechless is not really an option on a webinar, but Debenham's 118 stores and 12,000 staff and Arcadia's 450 stores and 13,000 staff to think that only one branch on Oxford Street may only remain as a physical presence in the High Street is staggering. There are many other casualties in this sector and retailers remain as online brands only such as TM Lewin, Oasis and Warehouse. The first thing you learn as a retail agent is that footfall is the primary generator of the most desired locations and that's obviously been a challenge in the last 12 months. Initial footfall counts recovered better in small market towns with open air shopping centres at circa 80% and covered shopping centres lagging behind at around 60% of normal footfall. Taking an index of 100 pre the first lockdown, April saw both Nottingham and Derby at 10. By September and October, Nottingham sat at 90 and Derby sat at 118, showing a ray of brightness looking forward or that old habits die hard. It is clear that pedestrianised high streets and covered shopping centres are the hardest hit. Land Securities, who own Blue Water and the White Rose Shopping Centre on the outskirts of Leeds, collected just 41% of their quarter's rent. Listed property company Derwent's retail and hospitality portfolio was down at 26% in central London. On the other hand, a private landlord with a range of local and neighbourhood parades is collecting close to 90% by the end of the quarter. The relaxation of paying business rates for the retail and hospitality sector finishes at the end of March this year. Coupled with the end of the protection afforded to tenants by the Covid Act for non-payment of rents at the same time and the end of furlough, I cannot see how this position will work through with an estimated 4.5 billion of rent debt in the market. Taking my once a day exercise walking the battleground of East Stoke at the weekend, the plaque highlights how Lord Lincoln's Yorkists suffered a huge defeat and the river turned to a river of blood. It feels like there is more pain to come and it is difficult to place a value on some retail assets. Void property still brings void rates, and in shopping centres, void service charges as well. With rent collections reduced, net income will be adversely affected. High street rents were under significant pressure prior to COVID, but that has only been exacerbated and turnover rents will become more prevalent. On a recent marketing call for a prime high street retail asset, the landlord suggested the strap line, unbelievable deals available. Government are supporting a number of initiatives through the High Street Fund and when 25% of income from business rates comes from retail, which only accounts for 5% of the economy, or if looked at another way, Boohoo and ASOS together pay 48 million in tax a year against the rates bill for the Debenhams and Arcadia stores of 160 million, it's clear the rating system needs to be addressed. Undoubtedly, Failing shopping centres and large retail units 
offer alternative users for redevelopment potential. And examples are the former Debenhams in both Derby and Leicester, where 259 and 338 build-to-rent units are to come forward. And I expect the Nottingham former Debenhams to follow closely behind. Enough of the glass half empty, there are sectors of the market where the glass is not just half full, but filling up. Local shopping has a, had a resurgence and we are concluding new lettings where rents are under 30,000 per annum. And new schemes anchored by Lidl and Aldi and the major supermarket convenience offerings are opening and progressing all over the region. Discounters like B&M and Home Bargains are actively sought by investors given their strong trading performance. Whilst the out-of-town retail sector has felt the effect of CVAs and administrations of Harvey's, Oak Furniture Land and the 55 outfoot stores from the Arcadia Group to come, M7 recently purchased 19 retail parks and Threadneedle have recently purchased another eight. The cream always rises to the top so no surprise that Foss Park Phase 3 opens in April with strong retailers committed on the units and next taking the unit that was going to be occupied by Debenhams. The roadside market is also performing strongly. We will continue to see groups like EG who run over 340 petrol filling stations take larger sites to run coffee shops, drive through and drive to units to keep us going. McDonald's, KFC, Taco Bell, Greggs, Costa, Starbucks and even Dunkin Donuts have concepts for this sector of the market and as a general rule roadside schemes are pre-let and pre-funded reducing the exposure and risk to developers and investors. These freehold sites are keenly fought over and the last three development sites we have sold all went to best bids and all received strong unconditional on planning offers. I could talk at great greater length on the dynamics of the retail and roadside market and whilst a passion of mine it's also important to review what investment is pouring or not pouring into the UK commercial real estate market. Total investment in 2020 was 40 billion which sits against the average for the last five years of 55 billion a reduction of 27 percent which is not surprising and spread 12 billion in Q1, 8 billion in Q2 6 billion in Q3 and 14 billion in Q4, which probably reflects the mood of us all over the last year. Turning to the East Midlands, the commercial real estate market is only 16% down from 1.35 billion to just over a billion. Taking account our region's nickname, the Golden Triangle, some 50% of all commitments were in the industrial sector and interestingly 30% in retail. Derby saw a significant fall in, in investment, but as always, it's the thinking behind the numbers that count. And in 2019, one deal, the purchase of 50% of the Derby on centre at 180 million taken out means that the levels for 19 and 20 are very similar at circa 100 million. The largest deal was Barbara Lynx, industrial for 57 million and a 4.1% yield, confirming all our thoughts that the industrial distribution sector is the most active out there. The largest retail deal highlights the attraction of discount retailers and involved the Wilkinson's 20,000 square foot store and large car park in Ilkeston. Leicester's performance was double that experienced in 2019, 170 million up to 363 million. With the industrial sector alone at 161 million, close to the total investment in the whole of 2019. Again, the two largest deals highlight the investments that are sought after in the market. 63 million for the Tesco anchored Beaumont Lee shopping centre at 6.4%, and the sale and lease packs undertaken by Next on their distribution units at 48 million, with a yield of 4.7% sold to the BA Pension Fund. Nottingham saw a much reduced level from 500 million to 265 million, but industrials in 2020 were only 50 million, less than the outstanding 300 million invested in 2019, which accounts for the significant difference. 
Interestingly, the largest deal was Granger Trust funding of 348 build to rent units for 55 million, which is a sector that investors are attracted to over the region, as highlighted with the 300 units Long Harbour developed in late 2019, and the Debenhams redevelopments by St James Security and Hammerson I've already highlighted in Derby and Leicester. One final highlight on the investment market that needs bringing to your attention is local authority investment. As you'll see from the slide, it was only a quarter of a billion in 2015 and rose to 2 billion in 2019, where some 850 million or 40% of that local authority investment was in retail and leisure. Local authorities who were buying for yield for income to support their annual spending budgets with low rates for public sector borrowing has dropped dramatically to just over half a billion last year. This sector of the market is unlikely to return with restrictions placed on local authorities raising public monies in debt for yield property deals by the Treasury in November. I'd like to hand over now to my colleague Craig Straw, Head of Business Space, to review the office market where much comment has been made over the longer term trends, working from home set against the benefits collaboration can bring within an office environment. Thank you Matt and good morning everyone. Um, whilst the pandemic obviously affected the East Midlands office market, its impact was perhaps not as negative as might be assumed given that a large proportion of the working population has spent little or no time in their offices since the first lockdown in mid-March last year. Overall across the three cities, take-up stood at 645,000 square feet which represented an approximate 20% reduction on the previous year. Highlights in Nottingham included Idea Gen's move down the road to its own self-contained building on Ruddington Fields Business Park for around 30,000 square feet. Leicester's largest office transaction was of a similar order of magnitude, with Eon acquiring 30,000 square feet at the Rutland Centre. Other highlights, apart from their football team's return to the top of the Premier League, included Octopus Energies and Cloud Call Group's both demonstrating their commitment to the city by acquiring additional space to complement their existing presence at Colton Square. Over in Derby, former BioCity occupier Tentamus travelled down the A52 from Nottingham to Derby to establish their own self-contained facility in the Orbis building on Pride Park, whilst homegrown success story Stanton Young, who own and operate the Cubo serviced office concept, expanded their Derby base by acquiring the 44,000 square foot former tax office, Northgate House, on Friargate. Perhaps another surprising statistic is not just the level of activity, but also where transactions did take place, they were generally at pre-pandemic levels. This is explained to a large extent, in my opinion, by our old friend, supply and demand. For not only did we see demand remain at reasonable levels, but also there was no sudden influx of supply and at the year end availability was relatively constant with just under 500 office properties available across the three cities providing a total of circa 1.7 million square feet compared to circa 1.6 million square feet as we entered into 2020 12 months earlier. As we progress into 2021 we will obviously be monitoring closely how the market develops. The, will these relatively constrained levels of supply be maintained or will occupiers take the opportunity to release space as lease ends and break options arise? Only time will tell. So what are the offices of the future and how do we think the market will develop? With the enforced mass participation in a worldwide work from home trial, many organisations and individuals have embraced the advantages this brings. From the employee's perspective, it's meant the end of long commutes into the office and the ability to get as to get so much more done without the distraction of colleagues coming along to pick your brains or just catch up from the weekend. From an employer's perspective, there is a prospect of offloading those expensive and unnecessary offices. So it's a no-brainer. No one needs offices anymore. It's a win-win all round, right? In my opinion, it's not quite so straightforward. There are a myriad of other factors to consider. From an employee's perspective, there is of course the mental health benefits that the social interaction in an office environment can bring. And if you genuinely don't enjoy spending any time in the office, dare I suggest that that perhaps points to a corporate failure to create the right environment rather than the office per se. As we all sit here in our third lockdown, 
It's great that we have the technology to be able to present our findings to you this morning. Going forwards, I think employers are going to have to create an office environment that employees will want to visit and spend time in. For most organisations, to a greater or lesser degree, I think it's vital. How else are we going to train the next generation and harvest the enthusiasm, new ideas, and perhaps different ways of thinking new recruits bring to an organisation? Certainly in our offices, so many ideas and opportunities spark not out of formal meetings, but from overhearing one side of a telephone call, or a discussion on going on round the corner between colleagues. We were already experiencing a flight to quality accommodation before the pandemic hit, as forward-thinking organisations sought to create their own take on the Google office, and I think this will continue apace as we move forward. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a complete Luddite, I do think that the lockdown has shown us new, more efficient ways of working and I'm sure going forwards many meetings will still take place over, place over Zoom or Teams rather than face to face, especially where extensive travel was previously involved to London for example or abroad. For most organisations I can foresee an element of flexible working being introduced into the working week and at face value that will mean a lower average headcount and the opportunity to downsize but balanced against that, I think is going to be an increased need for breakouts and social areas to facilitate the collaborative working and building of team spirit that will become more of a focus for the new office. I wonder if in five or ten years' time, whether the norm will have moved away from one person, one desk, to a much higher proportion of hot desking, much like happened over the previous decades, as the general office population moved out of their cellular offices and into an open plan environment. Another factor that may lead to a lower density of occupation is future-proofing the office against as yet unknown pandemics. I'm currently in the throes of hopefully doing a deal with the government department who I am told are acquiring significantly more space than they have traditionally needed for this particular function. Despite the vaccine rollout, their space planning allows for amongst other things a one-way circulation route around the entire office and a double width central walkway between desks to allow for social distancing to be maintained if required. Alongside the office environment itself, another important ingredient to the office of the future, I believe, will be the environment within which it sits. A wider range of amenities in the vicinity will mean that a trip to the office can be combined with other leisure activities, helping to increase the pull of the office. How transport links feature in the wish list for the Office of the Future will also be an interesting dynamic to observe. As of late, in Nottingham City Centre for example, availability of parking spaces has slipped down the list of occupier priorities, particularly since the introduction of the workplace parking levy combined with the rollout of Nottingham's tram system. But will a reduced reliance on public transport in a post-pandemic world feature in an occupier's mindset, preferring instead their own cars, particularly if trips to the office, are to be less frequent and potentially outside the traditional rush hour. On a macro scale, this could potentially lead to decentralisation from the traditional metropolitan areas such as London, Birmingham and Manchester, and see the establishment instead of a number of satellite bases rather than one or two metropolitan hubs. This certainly presents a potential opportunity for East Midlands cities to focus on and hopefully to potentially benefit from. And finally, who would have thought 12 months ago that I would have got this far into my roundup of the year without mentioning the B word? Obviously Brexit did happen, but it was all rather, shall we say, last minute. And as we are now barely a month on, in reality it's too early to tell what impact it's going to have on the market except perhaps some reassurance that the world hasn't ended and the market hasn't fallen off a cliff. I hate saying things like that and tempting fate, so before it can have any impact, here's another B word. Back to you, Matthew.